Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hi, this is Tim Bradbury, former Slangor and Saba player. You're listening to the Bola Bola Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of the Bola Bola Show. It's me, Elvin, and as usual, I have my buddy Sivan here. So, Sivan, how's it going, man? Everything's going fine, Elvin. Uh, as you know, today that we are extending our EMCO to another couple of weeks. So, you know, our listeners out there, stay safe. And, you know, do if there's any help or anything that, you know, anything can be done, do reach out to us. You know, we'll try our best to see what we can do for our fellow citizens here. But then yeah, also absolutely. at the same time, yeah. you know, take your opportunity to to listen to the Bola Bola Show podcast because we have another interesting episode today, right, Elvin? Yes, indeed. And the more you guys get locked at home, you know, let, let us keep you entertained at least. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. yeah. So, Steven, who's uh, who do we have on board today? Okay. So, uh, on this week, it's uh, all the way from Hong Kong. He's a former slang or player and also played for Sabah and he's a Hong Kong international himself. It's none other than Mr. Tim Bradbury. Welcome to the Bola Bola Show, Tim. Thanks, guys. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to talk about my time in in, uh, in Malaysia and uh, obviously my football career in yeah. other parts of the world as well. Yeah, f- f- fantastic, Tim. And uh, Tim, maybe you can share with your, with our listeners, you know, what projects or what are you currently involved in these days? Um. Well, the, the, the football side of things, obviously, the professional side retired in 99, um, sort of been doing a mix of quite a few things, um, sort of from sports, more sort of sports related, um, a lot of media stuff, um, a bit of you know, Champions League football, wherever there's sort of opportunities to get involved. I'm still doing some coaching now, so I sort of got my uh UEFA a coaching license uh quite a few years ago mm-hmm. and you know that's sort of take me into some of the professional teams in hong kong as well um i'm doing one of the amateur teams now in one of the in one of the local leagues here and uh you know just sort of keep my hand involved and uh enjoying the opportunity to, to as I say to stay involved in football yeah, and, and you know, and one, one more interesting thing for our listeners, you know, Tim, maybe you would like to share with our listeners your first professional experience, you know, as a part of the Liverpool team back in the 1979 to 1982 season. Yeah, yeah that was, uh, you know, I, I was born in Hong Kong. I schooled here until I was 16 and um, I got a, a, a sort of out of the blue, really, an opportunity. My father and the headmaster of my school here, they, my parents are from Liverpool originally, so mm-hmm. um, they wrote my, you know, they wrote to Liverpool and Everton, uh, basically asking for a trial. So this is probably something that would never happen <laughs> in this in this day and age now. Um, yeah, but, with, uh, with, with the help of a headmaster, right? <laughs> it's very yes. interesting. Yeah, no, no video, no yeah. analysis, no nothing like that. Yeah. Um, so they said, yeah, you know, you can come over. We'll have a look. Um, and I think it was a, uh, originally it was a sort of two week trial. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I sort of turned up at, at Anfield where the team was, you know, we'd normally change and train, uh, sorry, would get ready to go to training. Um, and yeah, sort of a very shy reserved, uh, boy from Hong Kong getting on the bus with the likes of Kenny Dalglish and Ian Rush, Alan Hansen, Graham Souness, all these sort of players. So, you know, I, I sat at the back. Uh, sorry, I sat at the front. They all went to the back, and um, you know, it, it, it was just a great experience. Those those sort of the two weeks of, of training, and then it extended to another week, and then I got offered a an apprentice contract there. So that's a sort of from sixteen to eighteen. You're, I'm sort of. I look back at it now as, as sort of cheap labour. Is the, is the two things. Um, you know, you're you're you're, pl- you're playing and you're training professionally as as you know, the, the first team and everybody else is. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, in amongst all that as well, there's a lot of boots to be cleaned. There's a lot of showers, toilets, and uh, changing rooms to be cleaned as well. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, as I said, a, a great opportunity. And I was very fortunate that, um, you know, I got offered a, a contract to, as I said, there's sort of this apprenticeship contract, which um, I think paid me a grand total of something like £38 
a week at that at that time. So twenty pounds was it a month? Can't remember. <laughs> it wasn't much. <laughs> okay. um, you know, twenty pound had to go to where I was living, um, and then you sort of lived off the rest. So miss those sort of all the days that are you know obviously that are in play now um, mm-hmm. in terms of the big cash. But um, uh, you know if, again. I don't think you could put a value really on that, on the opportunity to go there. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And of course, you know, you, I mean, once your time in Liverpool was done, you opened a new career, a new chapter in Hong Kong football. Uh, you had, a, I believe, a, what, a decade career there, playing for some of the big sites like South China and Rangers and all that. But I'm particularly interested about your time with Seiko FC because yeah. you had a couple of years where you played alongside Names like Ari Han, Dick Naninga, Rene van der Kerkhoff, Johnny Red. I mean, what was it like sharing the field with all these Dutch legends? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was quite sort of fortunate at the time. My, my contract had sort of come to an end in Liverpool and I, I, it was actually a Hong Kong club. Um, they were a second division team, I think. Um, I'd come across and uh, I think there was some sort of relationship with some of the management at Liverpool and, and somebody in Hong Kong. Um, so I ended up sort of playing four games in the second division. Um, I think one of the games, again, this was sort of me coming from Liverpool to play against a, sort of amateur teams in the second division here. And uh, I think I scored 13 goals in one game. And that was that was enough to sort of get Seiko interested. Um, and, you know, the, the, the other benefit for me as well, because I'm born here, I'm, I'm also classed as a, as a local player as well. Okay. So uh, I, you know, as as in those days, there were seven foreigners in in each in each team, um, and then I myself and I think there was one other. We we could, you know, still be classed, still be called foreigners, but classed as local players as such. So yeah, I was very fortunate. I came back and uh, the Seiko team at the time was obviously Dick Naninger up front, who'd scored for Holland in the in the World Cup final against Argentina. Yes, yes. Um, Theo de Jong. Um, we, we, had, we had a number of different inter- games that we played. So in those days, we played against the likes of the Corinthians from Brazil. Um, and generally in those games, we'd get uh, a couple of guest players. And obviously with the Dutch connection, there was the Van der Kerkhoffs would come out, Johnny Rep, um, and, and, and others. Um, so you know we had we had some good times, some very good, some good games, and obviously you learn a lot from from these guys as well. So uh, again, you know it was a great experience to sort of come from obviously from the Liverpool side of things, where you've again got these great players to then come into a team where you know you're you're, you're continuing that. Mm-hmm. Harry Hahn was in in this in the second year. Um, in that year, I don't know if you remember those like called Peter Bodak. He played for Manchester United and Coventry. Um, Benny Vent, who was a Swedish international player as well. So, um, you know, just an opportunity to play with some, you know, very good players at the time. And and Hong Kong football at that time, again, was sort of, you know, a lot of money in, in the game and a lot of interest and a lot of good quality players. Maybe, you know, a few coming to the end of their careers as such. But, um, you know, you, 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 when you've got that quality and, and you can sort of watch and learn, it's, uh, as I said, Great opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, yep, and Tim, you you arrive in Malaysia then, you know, to play for Selangor in uh, 1992. So, would you would you like to care to share with our listeners, you know, how did that move came about? Sure. Well, we we'd actually left Hong Kong in uh, in '91, so we mm-hmm. sort of decided that we we you know we'd give a, we'd give Australia a go, and uh, a friend of mine. Um, Gary Phillips, who I think he coached with Sabah uh, in the past. Um, Gary was involved with Sydney Olympic at the time, and he, um, he he got me the contract to go down there. So I played, I was supposed to do a two-year contract with Sydney Olympic, but again, this was sort of before the A-League and um, and sort of the, the, the stability of the clubs now. It was, it was a little bit difficult place to be in terms of getting paid on time and things like that. So uh, I had a young family and I had the opportunity to come to Selangor. So I'd, I'd done well in, in, in Australia. I finished top joint top goal scorer in the league uh, down there. And the opportunity came to, to, you know, to come up to Malaysia. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it, it was a great opportunity and I was, I wasn't really sure, you know, 
what the situation was. You know, I, I had friends who had played in Malaysia, the likes of Abbasad and Alistair Edwards played, people like that who had also come back to Sydney Olympic as well. Um, you know, but nobody said don't go there. They, they all said it's a you know, great opportunity, great place to be. So, um, yeah, so that, that, was, that was really how it, how it sort of came about. Mm-hmm. And what was your first impression when you were shooting up for slang at that time? Um, I think again, yeah, you know, I, I've played with some big teams, obviously, in, in you know, the, say Liverpool, Seiko were the big team, South China and Hong Kong as well. Sydney Olympic were sort of the, one of the top teams in Australia also. Um, so, you know, I'm very fortunate to play with, with, with big clubs. Um, it was a sort of the, the, the time where I think, you know, you, you were going to play in stadiums of 40,000, 50,000. If you played Singapore, maybe 60,000, uh, you know, people in the stadium. Um, so, you know, in that respect and traveling to games and hotels and things like that, um, you know, they, it was definitely done a little bit more, let's say, more professionally as such. Um, you know, the, the slang or... I think it was a difficult time when I went there, to be honest. That was that was the big problem. Uh, I think they'd had a, a successful season just before that. And then uh, my, I think it was a gentleman, Maslan Harun, had come in to take over the team. And obviously there was a, a lot of issues, I think, around that. And, um, you know, I sort of remember 40,000 people at Medeca Stadium not being very happy and, you know, obviously with the games and results not going the way, you know, ideally they should have gone. Um, you know, I think the, the crowd let us know. I think not so much the players as, as such, but I think the the sort of management and what happened after that. Mm. And, and and indeed, you know, that, that season itself, 1992, you know, uh, was, wasn't very, uh, wasn't a good year for Slango. They finished bottom of the league. Uh, do you think the only reason for this team's poor performance is just management side or were there other issues around the squad at that time? Um, we had issues. Uh, I think, you know, obviously at the time there was Carl Stromsick was in goal. There was myself. Yeah. Uh, we were supposed to have Ross Greer, who is, I think, coming from uh, Hong Kong to play for us mm. as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, Ross is a you know, big, big, strong player. He would have been a big help in terms of, you know, things like set pieces, free kicks, corners, anything like that at all. You know, he, he scores a lot of goals from those sort of, uh, those sort of um, yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and again, he's, you know, he's a good, good individual player as well. So I think Ross was very late coming to uh, Selangor when we thought he would come a little bit earlier. So I think that, you know, that didn't really help. Um, yeah, in terms of the players that we had, you know, I think we had, you know, some good players, mm-hmm. um, but maybe not overall obviously not strong enough to uh you know to, to do as uh, to do as well as we should have done mm. and 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 in that season was uh, robert dunn as well in the team no i think he was the year before as far as i think that okay, was but carol but carol storm six was in goal yeah carl yeah. still yeah he was still there so i'm still in touch with him still ah, say hello to him every now and again so I see, I see. Because, uh, because, yeah, because we, uh, I really remember during the uh, our school days, you know, when we used to really support Slango and uh, Carol was definitely, you know, the uh, the most uh, one of the most I would say iconic goalkeepers for Slango at the time. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, again, again, you know, he obviously was a, was a, was a a goalkeeper as such. So it, it, yeah, had we had an outfield player, maybe things might have been a bit, a little bit different in terms of mm-hmm. you know making the team a bit stronger. Um, but it, you know, it's an unfortunate period of time. Um, you know, obviously nobody wants Slango to go down into the, into the second division and nobody wants to be involved in the team that goes down as well. So, um, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it was just the circumstances and, and the situation at, the, at that time. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I was fortunate, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to leave Malaysia. I managed to get to get a contract with Sabah in, um, the following yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. And was there any effort from Slango to, you know, keep you? Or, you know, it was a, a mutual decision that you all wanted to play for Samba? Um, <laughs> there, there was an unfortunate incident sort of towards the end. And I, and, um, I remember seeing the, uh, the team manager had come to uh, the, the condos where we were staying in Shah Alam. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we sort of found out in a roundabout way that I think our last game actually was away to Saba. And it, 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 it shouldn't have ended this way, but I think they, you know, that what was supposed to happen was the families were going to get evicted from the apartments. Oh, and wow. while we were away in Saba, and uh, we we managed to get that sort of quashed and, and sorted out. And uh, uh, yeah, it was just an unfortunate time. Uh, you know, I think, again, the club obviously were not happy with the way things had gone, uh, probably on, on and off the field as well. So um, no, I think it was more a case of sort of, thank you very much and and we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll see you later. Would I like to have stayed for sure? I mean, you know, it's a, it, is a, it is a great club. Okay. Helping try and get back into the into the top league would have been a, a top yeah. priority. Yeah, and and you know, I well, well, I hope. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe there are some some memories that you would like to erase. But what about your fondest memories? Maybe you'd like to share with our listeners. What what are your fondest memories during your stay in Malaysia? Overall, you mean mm-hmm. including Sabah or the yeah, uh, just... yeah, yeah, both Selangor and Sabah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think look, meeting. And I, you know, I'm still in touch as well. Meeting some great people. Mm-hmm. The food is <laughs> is yeah. pretty special as well. Um, you know, the, the wife and I would be we'd take the kids to school, drop them off, and then it'd be uh, roti chennai and tea for a bit of breakfast. You, there, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure you still miss it. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. fry kwetiau, I think, is my number one. That's oh, my go okay, okay. my go to meal at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, the, yeah, we we were unfortunate at Slang, or that was that was just a, an unfortunate time. But I think again, you know, the opportunity to play at the likes of the Medeca Stadium, forty thousand people, yeah. you know, passionate fans who want the team to do well. Um, I, again, I, I was a little bit. I think that if it was the year or two two years later, they opened the Shah Alam Stadium, which was again, I'm not sure, eighty thousand people. I think. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, uh, yeah. The, just unfortunate not to get involved, you know, to, to be able to play there. Um, yeah, I think with Sabah, it was, uh, I think we were the first second division team to get to the FA Cup final. Mm-hmm. And we played uh, KL in the final. But unfortunately, I was, gonna, I, was t- I was taking a free kick and I tore my thigh muscle um, sort of like 20 minutes into the game. And uh, unfortunately, we... We didn't go on to win the final, but um, you know, again, good people in Malaysia, in in Kota Kinabalu, and uh, you know, I, I again still in touch with people there. And uh, yeah, if I can say a, a, a special hello to Bobby Chua, who's uh, ah, going through, a, okay, he's going yeah, through a few, yeah. he's got a few problems going on at the moment, and uh, hopefully he's you know, he's, he's medical side of things is. Anyway, I'd like to wish him all the best anyway. Yeah, we, wish Bobby, we wish Bobby training, all training. the best. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Tim, what, what, what about, uh, what do you recall most about the Slango singapore rivalry? I mean, even though it was just, I mean, it wasn't a long time for you, but you, you guys did beat Singapore at the Medeca Stadium, right? In that, in that one season you were there. Yeah, I think I, I, think I, scored, I, think I, I scored in that game as well. I think that was mm-hmm. one of the, sort of the highlights. I think I had a, a, a dribble inside the box and mm-hmm. managed to put the ball uh, in the back of the net. So, um, yeah, I think we away in away in Singapore. Didn't, I'm not sure what we did there. Uh, mm-hmm. I think with Sabah as well, we beat Singapore in 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 KK. Uh, I think we got thumped seven 0 when we went there. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so you know, again, Singapore is a you know. A great opportunity to you know to go and play in uh, in the, in that sort of stadium in that sort of environment. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, yeah. and uh, of course, uh, let's talk about your international career. I mean, most fans in Malaysia will always remember of you scoring a hat trick in the three four defeat against Malaysia in the nineteen ninety four Asian Games. I mean, what are your memories of that game? And you know, when the draw was made, knowing that Hong Kong is going to play against Malaysia, what was going through your mind at that time? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I. I... You know, we, we were in a situation again after sort of uh, Saba where, um, you know, with, with a young family, really I, I was looking for a little bit more stability. Uh, we, hadn't, we hadn't, we sort of discussed with Saba what was going to happen next, but nothing was ever sort of finalised and agreed. Um, and Hong Kong really at the time sort of offered the most, you know, obviously coming back here, there was an offer to come back to Hong Kong as well. Um, 
and and I, obviously when I came back, then I sort of got back into the national team setup as well. So I started with the national team in sort of '86, uh, and you know obviously to go to the Asian Games was a great honour and a great uh, a great privilege to go and do that. So you know yeah, I mean I caught up with obviously a lot of uh, old friends and old enemies from the, from, from my time in Malaysia. Um, yeah, it was just one of those games. I think we were a little bit disappointed we didn't get the win. Um, yeah, but I was lucky enough to, you know, to score those three goals. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, again, a game. I think at the end of the day, we should have won. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that your only hat trick for the Hong Kong national team? No, I've. Uh, who did we play? I think we played Macau. I think I was actually on. I think I scored. I scored three goals in something like four minutes, five minutes, something like that. So I wasn't wow. sure if they, what the what the record was at the time for, mm. you know, the fastest hat trick. That's a pretty fast hat trick. In five, it was pretty quick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was. Uh, Yeah, so I think I've got. I think I've had two. Mm, okay. In my, in my playing career. So. All right. So you know, let's talk about some current news now. So, uh, what's your take on Hong Kong football today? You know, has it changed a lot from your playing days? Uh, yes. I mean, I think uh, you know, I think most leagues suffer. You know, when you've got the likes of you know the Premier League, La Liga, and various other international leagues being shown on television. Um, you know, you, you depending on when those kickoffs are, you're always going to lose, you know, some, some interest as well. Um, I think here, you know, the, the, a lot of the clubs are, you know, can be better run, and they need to understand that what they're providing is a, you know, it's a, it's a form of entertainment, and you know, you've got to be, you've got to be attracting fans in, you've got to be, um, you know giving them a reason to come and watch local football and that comes down to what's you know what's going on on the pitch what's going on uh you know off the pitch in terms of the marketing side of things and and the quality of players that you're looking to bring into into the leagues here as well so there, you know there's been some different things going on we've had uh you know, a couple of different ceos we've got a new national team coach at the moment and uh you know it it It's an interesting time. I think, I think a lot of the, a lot of it can be changed and should be changed in terms of the, you know, the, the, the recruitment of players and clubs. I think just tend to be a little bit lazy, and players will stay at a club and will stay in Hong Kong for a long period of time. And you know, if I've seen this guy play in one team and he was so-so, am I going to go and watch him play in another team? Probably not. So, you know, this is what I think the clubs have got to understand that they're. They're, they've got to they've got to offer a value product. Everybody now wants your 50 Hong Kong dollars, whether it's Starbucks or whoever, wants that money off you for a coffee. You know, wants you to buy a coffee off them, 50 dollars, whatever it might be, to get into the stadium. If you're not offering a product that is enticing, interesting, then I'll go and spend my money somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Okay, now. Uh... To the topic of naturalization in football, I mean, it's, it's been a hot topic in Malaysia recently. And, you know, judging from, you know, the, the makeup of the Hong Kong team today, I mean, I can, we can see that it's, it's an approach that has been heavily used. But what is your overall opinion with regards to the use of naturalized players? I think, well, again, the, the rule in Hong Kong is that uh, the player needs to be here for seven years and that's seven consecutive years. So, mm-hmm. you know, what, what you're going to get And I think what we have in the Hong Kong team at the moment is you know, uh, a number of good players, but they've been here too long. Mm-hmm. You know, we've now got players who, you know, I think we're probably the oldest, could well be one of the oldest national teams ever. Mm-hmm. But 35 year old, and the, and most of these are most of the foreigners who are coming into the into the teams now are, you know, mid late late 20s. 30s, 30. I mean, I think we've still got 39 year olds playing. So um, it it's it's not the right way that things should be done. Um, it it needs you know you need to have on the ground development of players. You need to be um, and then you've got to look at locally and you've got to say well if this 39 year old can play, you know where's where's 
where's the competition for him? Mm-hmm. And then you've got to look at what's being done to develop players and then ask the question, why is this player, why are these players not getting a game? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think it's, it's a long shortcut, if, if that makes sense. So you've got your yes, seven years that you need to wait, mm-hmm. but then you're putting in players who really, you know, maybe one or two can add value, but, you know, the majority of the team shouldn't be, shouldn't be foreigners, I don't think. Okay, all right. And, and again, you need to believe in your, in, your, in your players, in your system of football and how you want to play. And, um, you know, th- you have to develop that. And I think that's maybe one of the things that, you know, a lot of associations don't, you know, if, if you're always chopping and changing because results are not going your way, you need to, you know, you need, you need to invest in a long-term plan. What is our style of football? How are we developing these players in order to, you know, you know, I remember when, when I sort of first started with the national team, Japan was, um, was you know, we, we were drawing with Japan away in, in Tokyo. But then they knew what they had to do in order to develop the game. They, they, they picked their style of football. They picked the players that they knew. They picked the coaches that would be able to deliver that. And obviously Japan are now sitting top of, you know, Asian football and has been for a long time now. Mm-hmm. So I, think, I don't think there's I don't think there's short, shortcuts. I think you just need belief in in what is happening at the grassroots level. What's happening at you know there's always talk as well. Is is there too much coaching in football? Should players at a younger age be allowed to you know just develop and then be brought into uh, you know into more of a structured academy type program? Mm. And and how is it like in Hong Kong in terms of like the perception from the parents with regards to football and do they see like they can make a career out of football or it's more like other sports like basketball and all that perhaps no unfortunately the the professional sports in Hong Kong have not really um, you know especially on the soccer side of things most mm-hmm. most parents will you know I think use the football to a degree in order to sort of get a better you know report card done for the next school they're going to go to i mean you know we're hong kong is very very focused on the education side of things and this is this is one of the big problems we we mm-hmm. have here the government are again not so proactive they'll they'll do what is sort of necessary they'll build another pitch but it, it what goes on that pitch i mean I, i always remember going back to uh the liverpool training the new one that they built out in in sort of kirby way out outside of Liverpool and you know you see all these pictures and it, it comes down to what you know who's on these pictures who's doing the training the players is it you know is this is this what they want is this what they you know is this what they're willing to sacrifice everything for and I, and I don't think we have that here to be honest mm-hmm. okay. Malaysia I think may, maybe Malaysia is different um, I mean I think there's the structure I think down in again I sort of touch base with Alice Redwoods down in Johor. They seem to have a little bit more of a, a plan, which is sort of similar to maybe what Kitchi are doing here in Hong Kong. Um, but then, you know, the, the, the flip side of Kitchi is that you look at their team now playing in the AFC. And again, you've still got two 39-year-olds playing in the team and a number of 30, 30 plus. So it, where, uh, my question would be, where are the local players? Mm-hmm. Okay, very good question indeed. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, any last questions from yourself, Elwi? Uh, yeah, Tim. You know, in your playing career, you know, you play as a forward all all the while and all these throughout all the many clubs that you played for. Maybe you can let our listeners know, like some of the toughest opponents or toughest centre backs that you have come across in your career that you, that you still remember them till today. Hopefully, not haunting you in your dreams. <laughs> um, I mean, I remember. I think I think it was Pahang. We went. We played away. I uh, is it? I can't remember the names of the players, but I, I think that's one game I've come off with uh, bruises everywhere. That was uh, that was quite a battering in that game. Uh, Australia obviously is very is very tough. Um, so uh, you know most of the Australian games you you were getting sort of knocked around a little bit. Um, but that one game I think in in Pahang, if I had to name one game, that would probably be it in terms of getting of getting smashed around a little bit. So, uh, but um, 
yeah, I mean, you know, you've, you've got to obviously you take these things now. The, the game has changed quite a bit, obviously, in terms of the protection of the players, um, you know, tackles from behind and things like that are, are not allowed anymore. So the game has changed. Um, and obviously, they, you know, it's there to protect the players and allow the game to, to develop and, and flow a little bit more freely. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Um, any last word from yourself, Tim? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, again, I just like to wish everybody, and you know, obviously in Malaysia, stay safe in the in these uncertain times. And um, you know, hopefully, the football in Malaysia is is going to be get back on track. I think again, I've got another friend of mine, Brad Maloney, is I think he's involved with the, yes, the yes. national team set up down there as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a place I obviously have very special memories of of Malaysia, and uh, we're we've actually I think we looked at this. Malaysia, my second home, as a as a possible opportunity mm, to. Okay. <laughs> so right. I think I think that's on that's on on hold at the moment. But um, you know, the opportunity to come back is 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 always sort of in the back of my mind somewhere. Well, yeah, always think of the roti chana and teh tarik, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you, read, but, you read my mind. <laughs> by the way, when was the last time you were in Malaysia? By the way, I mean, I was actually back a couple of years ago. I was doing some oh, work okay, with. Okay. Uh, and and then uh, to be honest, it was quite amazing. The, the the change in in KL from when I was there was we had literally oh, the yes, I think it was the Concord Hotel. You had Hard Rock. Is that still there? Yeah, it's yes, still it there. Is, it is. Yeah. Hard Rock's still there, and uh, yeah. the Federal Highway back to Shah Alam. But uh, you look at it now; it's it's obviously changed hugely since since my time there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, yeah, at least you remember the federal highway. Okay. <laughs> you, when you're sitting on that federal, when you're sitting there waiting for the traffic to move, you remember. <laughs> you do remember. Yeah. So, uh, again, very, you know, very, very, very happy, and and thank you again for the opportunity to uh, to speak with you guys today. And uh, our pleasure. Yourself. Yeah, thank thank you indeed for joining us on this show, team. Thank you for your time. No yeah. problem. You guys take care, and uh, you know, best wishes to everyone in Malaysia. Indeed, indeed. I mean, we, we hope to see you again in Malaysia soon, definitely. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. All right, Elwin, any last words? I know, that's all. Thank you. Yep. All right. So, with that, folks, uh, we will end this week's episode of the Bola Bola Show. Goodbye for now, and thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.